Hello, my name is Antonio Valente, and for 25 years I've been working in financial services as a trusted resource to help individuals, families, and companies create and protect their legacy. Now, most people think being a wealth advisor is about stocks and bonds, or even what the market is doing today or next week, but it's not. It's about helping people create and protect their legacy. It's been my experience that the most successful people or families are driven by living a life of purpose. And that's the secret ingredient in creating a legacy. So gear up because we're about to climb the Legacy Summit. Friends, thanks for tuning in. This is episode seven of the Legacy Summit. And as a reminder for our first time guests, so I'm a wealth advisor based in Dallas, Texas, servicing clients across the country. This show is not about investing. It's not about money. It's about living a life of purpose in my conversations with individuals and organizations around the country that are legacy driven. Emilio, it's nice to be back in the studio today. I've missed you. I've missed everyone. All the great folks here. You guys are always so wonderful to me. And it's a cold, it's a rainy day, but we're bringing a little sunshine today into this studio. We've got some really, really great stuff happening today. Um, it's hard to get in here. You know, my first priority is obviously to service our clients and um, business has been uh, quite busy. But that said, I really am excited about this because it's playoff season in the NFL, and I don't think things probably, I think most folks are gonna say, it didn't go Dallas's way this year. And um, I think our viewers are gonna really like our next guest. So he was drafted second round in the 1982 NFL draft by the Dallas Cowboys. He played his NFL career right here, right down the street, Emilio. A student, scholar, athlete, graduated from Yale and received all Ivy League honors. He shared the Ivy League championship in 1980, 1981. Um, let's please welcome my friend Jeff Rohr to the Legacy Summit. Jeff, welcome to the show, buddy. Thank you, Antonio. I'm, uh, I'm excited to be on and uh, we've got a lot to talk about. We do. Uh, about one of the legacies, one of the legacies. That's right. That's right. Because you, your legacy goes beyond the grid, right, my friend? It goes, <laughs> it's on, it's off the field. Um, you're multifaceted, so many different moving parts, and I can't wait to tackle them with you here. Pun intended, my friend. Tackle you know, them funny. with you here today. Uh, <laughs> my life is uh, strange and amazing at the same time. It's always an adventure. That's how you know you're doing it right, my friend. That's how you know you're doing it right. <laughs> so Jeff, I got to tell you, I feel like uh, we could have used you here in town a couple weeks ago when uh, when the Cowboys were playing Green Bay. Did you watch that game? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, you know, it was disappointing. Um, playoff football is a completely different animal. Yeah. Um, you know, you can do well during the season, but one or two mistakes in a playoff will, will, will take you out. So you almost have to be perfect. And if the other team is, uh, even more fired up and more focused than you, you will get beat. Yeah. And, um, you know, you even the games this weekend, they were amazing, but you could see who wanted to, sh who, who showed up to play and who didn't. Right. I mean, it was very, very simple. I mean, there, you know, the game last night was, you know, was very close, but in the end, you know, Kansas City just pulled it out. Um, I, I've been spending a lot of time in Detroit and, um, with my, with my work. And I will say that I have kind of fallen in love with that team. Um, they play hard and the coach is amazing. And, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of thinking they might go all the way. I don't know. Yeah. I, I love their story. I mean, I love a good underdog story. I was taking the elevator up here and, um, I was telling the person inside there, I'm like, I, I've always resonated with the story like of Rocky, Rocky Balboa, you know, the fictional yeah. boxer, the underdog comes from nowhere out of nothing Philly, you know? And, you know, I, I feel like... I, Italian guy I grew up outside New York City, like I so it just resonated all the time. But that Detroit Lions story is really incredible. I mean, you're seeing grown men out there; they're crying. They're, they haven't been there in thirty something years. It's it's amazing. Yeah, it's you know what, and things go in streaks. I'm a big street guy. Yeah, and, uh, you know the Rangers story this year. That was just 
out of nowhere. Right? Amazing. I know it. So it's kind of weird. Things happen in, happen in the same year. And I, that's why I'm kind of thinking it could be one of those strange energy things with the Lions. I'm not sure, but whatever. All right. We're going to get your, <laughs> we're going to get your Super Bowl picks a little bit later on here. Okay. So, okay. so just get them ready. But you know, Jeff, okay. we love, we love working and, um, and having um, professional athletes, former professional athletes on the show here. It takes so much hard work, dedication, focus, um, to achieve that level of success. And your story is so unique and incredible because, um, well, it just goes beyond sports. You know, it just, it, it's not, your, your story is not a football story. It's a life story. It's a story about authenticity. <laughs> and I just absolutely love it. But I always like to say where it's a good place to start, it's in the beginning. So let's go there. Let's talk about the early years. Um, Cause <laughs> I'll tell you this, it's not easy being a student athlete, right? And it's something that I tell my daughter all the time. She's in varsity cheer here at Capel High and they had nationals over the weekend and she, they finished second. I picked her up last night and she's got a nice, you know, medal, but it's hard work. You know, she was up at 5 a.m. and here and that, and, you know, it, it's just tough, but you did it at Yale. And so what's, what was that like managing just a normal school curriculum, if we can call Yale sure. academics normal, but that and D1 football, what's that like? Yeah, it was, um, I think, I mean, clearly the hardest thing about any Ivy League school, including Yale, is getting in. So, you know, I credit my uh, my teachers and my mom and dad for pushing me hard um, in high school to at least get a chance to get in. And then once you get in, um, you know, there's 100 guys on the freshman team, and you, and you have to find a way to make yourself stand out. Um, they they actually brought me in as a center because I was an all-California center, and I didn't want to play center. So they said, defense go that way, offense go that way. <laughs> and I... I uh, I played a couple couple days in the first days of uh, of camp there, and um, the offensive and defensive coaches were fighting over me. They um, the defensive guys won, and thank God because <laughs> I would have never been a linebacker in the NFL. But it was you know I mean school school there um, you know it was difficult because everybody everybody that goes to Yale is a friggin' genius. Um, yeah. I'm not me included. Not me included. <laughs> they let me in the one to win football game. But I was close enough. Um, but, it, you know, it all worked out. It was a lot of hard work to get practice in, get your studies in, and have time to go out and socialize, which we did a tremendous amount of. Yeah. <laughs> hey, look, you can work hard. You can play hard as well because you've earned it. Is we did. Right? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So you're, um, you're playing at Yale. And were you, like, during those years, during that time, like, was there like the little bird on the shoulder? Like, were you thinking post-graduation, hey, I, you know, I, I might have a shot at the NFL here. You know, I, I, you think about it, but you don't realize that, that you are a decent player, especially when you're um, at Yale, because you see all the big boys on the TV on the weekend, you know, the yeah. UFC, the Michigan, um, those kind of guys. But I was, uh, I was sitting in my room studying for a final and the phone rang, one of those old black uh, dial phones. And yeah. um, uh, I picked it up, and and the gentleman came on. He said, this is Gil Brandt from the Dallas Cowboys, and we just drafted you in the second round. And I said, pretty funny, and I hung up the phone. <laughs> um, the phone rang immediately again, um, and they said, Jeff, this is uh, so-and-so from KRLD Radio. You just hung up on Gil Brandt. You're a Dallas Cowboy. And I went, oh, my God. And they said, okay, we had a four-second delay. You're okay. Um, we're going to call you back. <laughs> So they did, and uh, and and then you know, and then Gil came on, and I was drafted, and and then from there, to be honest with you, um, you know, I worked I worked really really hard getting ready for camp. So there wasn't there if there was better if there was somebody in better shape than me, good maybe maybe one or two, but not many. And then you know you go through a rookie camp, and I was excelling in in rookie camp with the Cowboys, um, doing very well as a second round should. You know, I was doing my job, but. Um, then finally the veterans come in, you know, and I'm seeing guys that I was literally uh, in pajamas watching them on TV, idling them, and now you're lined up against them. And after a couple of days of that, you're going like, hey, maybe I can, maybe I deserve to play in this league, you know, and and you got to earn your way up. That does, nothing's easy in that business, nothing. And you can get hurt. Yeah. Um, there's so many circumstances that can run you out of the game. But after you, after you play with the veterans for a little bit, you're like, okay. You know, maybe I'm good enough, and then eventually it turned out that I was, and it was a tremendous honor. Man, that's in, that's incredible. 
<laughs> tell me about the draft. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about those days and what like football has developed into, and especially like drafts, because now I was explaining to my mom the other night, you know, she's been watching a lot of these games with me at night. We watch a lot of hockey and she's watching this and we were watching the game. She was pulling for Buffalo yesterday, by the way, she wanted them that story. She's like, those people were out there freezing. <laughs> she wanted them to win. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but I was explaining to her about the draft and what it's like today, because it's like, it's like Disneyland NFL. It's incredible. What was the draft like back then? I mean, I mean, you just got the phone call at home, right? Right. It's very yeah, different. Well, yeah, no, I was, I was in, in my, in my, uh, dorm at Yale. Um, wow. Uh, but you know, it, the NFL now, I would I would say um, more for the Cowboys back then because it was an extremely extremely uh, complex defense, and there was probably a lot of guys that were better athletes than me. But you had to know the defense, and if you missed your assignment, it was a touchdown. Yeah. So because um, there's a lot, we had a lot of man to man coverage, and when everybody's man to man and you get beat, it's over with. So um, you couldn't blow your assignment. So I think the fact that I was kind of a sharp kid and a good athlete. Um, as well as, you know, all the Cowboys back then, you know, you had to be super smart. Everybody that played on those teams was super smart. Yeah. And now the game has evolved into that's kind of the way everybody uh, runs their operation. It's a very, very complicated game. So I think there's, you know, there's room for guys that aren't that sharp. But I, I will tell you, most of the guys in the NFL these days yeah. have to be pretty sharp or you're going to get beat and you're going to lose a game. That's what the playoffs are all about. Dude. One missed this, one missed assignment. It's over. There's so many great quotes about you from your former teammates. Um, one sticking out to me right now was Randy White, obviously a legend around here. And uh, he was excited when they drafted you. He knew you were coming in, and he knew you were going to be smart because you went to Yale. And, <laughs> I, and I saw that quote, and I'm like, that's 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 pretty cool. you got to love the man, sir. Yeah. Um, he was one of the guys I idolized. You know, I wasn't quite in the jam. I was probably a little older than but. To be on the field with guys like Randy, um, to be on the field with guys like Dorsett and Walls, Ned Jones, um, those guys became family to me and still are. I love those guys. Um, and, uh, you know, it, that doesn't go away. It doesn't go away. Bob Rooney was the, uh, what you call him, king of the linebackers, and I learned a lot from Bob. He taught me my position, as did Jerry Tubbs and Tom Landry. But um, it was it was a family and uh, I, I do love those guys to this day, and uh, and I'm proud to be a Dallas Cowboy. That's that's awesome. You now you, you mentioned Tom's name. You played for legendary coach, right, Tom Landry? Yeah. Um, when I think of coaches in the NFL, I probably think of Vince first, right? And just because yeah. he's just larger than life. I mean, the the, the trophy is named after the the guy. Uh, but I would probably tell you right after there is Tom, and I feel like in a lot of ways he's the patron saint of the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> Um, what was it? What was he like on and off the field? What was it like playing for him? Well, the first thing is the first time I met uh, Coach Landry, it was in the old building on Central Expressway, and um, and Gil had flown all the drop choices in, and he goes, "Oh, hey, Tom's right. Tom's right up there." I was the only drop choice on the office then. He goes, "I'm going to get Tom and introduce you." And as I walked up to him, he's a big guy. You know, I always <laughs> saw him on TV. I thought he was a little guy. Um, but Tom was like six foot three, but when all the guys had the pad standing around him. So first thing was, he's a big guy. Second thing was, um, I, I think he was a, a fabulous coach. Um, a lot of guys said he didn't get close to the, to the team so much, but I really feel that he was such a good guy and, and loved his team so much that how do you get close to guys when you know they have families, um, and you might have to cut them someday. Wow. Um, that's just the way the business is. You know, it's a brutal, brutal business, and you're only as good as your last game. And I think he kept an arm's distance just because – arm's length to distance – just because he did care about people so much as opposed to not care about them. Wow. And I – one last thing about Tom is um, I I had a couple years there where I didn't behave really well. <laughs> um, and when you don't behave well um, or say the wrong thing, you get to meet Tom Landry. So I had quite a few one-on-ones with Tom, and uh, when they put his hat in the ring, there was a big celebration on the field, and uh, all the players were there, and he walked right into this thing, and he saw me out of the corner's eye, and him and Alicia walked right up to me and shook my hand, he goes, Jeff, how you been? And I was a really good coach, and he was just, you know, he was curious that I had transitioned out of the game okay, and a couple of the 
guys that played there 14 years came right up to me and they said like dude what was that all about like you know, roger stallback's right over there i go well you you know maybe he just didn't get to know how to know tom because you know because i got thrown in the pokey enough to meet tom yeah so. <laughs> hey jeff what's um what's the toughest part of the game i mean it's obviously uh, it's incredibly difficult in terms of physical toll. I see them out there. I watch them sometimes and I'll say to my mom, like, I don't know how they all just don't break out there, but is it, is it mental toughness? Is it physical toughness, a combination? It, what would you it, say? It, it, it's everything. I mean, you, you don't play in that league unless you play hurt. Um, you know, especially as the season goes on, you got to play through in, in, injuries. And as soon as you get bad, good one, as soon as you get one heel, something else pops up. So, um, and back when we played, you know, it was experimental astral turf, um, bounties on the wide receivers and stuff, where you're literally trying to put people out of the game um, as they were us. And nowadays there's a flag on every play that gets even close to that. The quarterbacks back then got absolutely brutally hammered every game. Yeah. Um, and now they don't get touched. So I don't know. I'm kind of like in this mindset where, you know, any new records, there should be an asterisk by them because the guys playing now play, they're, they're playing under different rules. Yeah. Yeah. I think about, you know, um, I remember watching that game when uh, Lawrence Taylor, um, you know, hit uh, Theismann and just seeing that. And I just remember, like, you know, I was thinking about all these things like early this morning at the house, having a cup of coffee. And I'm like, my goodness, it was truly battles back then i would hear these stories from nfl films about what was going on and i remember these games and a lot of times now i'm like this is a contact sport i don't know why that flag is on the field i don't know what's going on i know <laughs> i don't know i mean i guess it, i guess it's a good thing yeah you know um the game's still fun to watch um they're they're you know the hitting's a lot different when you see these guys putting in their shoulder and all that stuff as opposed to trying to take somebody's head off yeah which is what we did we had extremely physical um physical team and physical defense. Um, but, the, you know, the other thing, too, that you, you didn't see back then because the resolution on the TVs was so bad, but it was a really bloody game. Yeah. Um, you know, now it's 4K, whatever. You can see everything. There's no blood. But I will <laughs> tell you, when I was out there, it was a bloody mess. So I mentioned NL, NFL films because there's just an incredible one on you. We're going to share the link, you know, um, in, in the show here today. Um, and I said this earlier, obviously your story goes way beyond just the football field. But, um, when I watched that, I immediately called you up on the phone and I said, <laughs> there was one frame where you're crying. I started crying and yeah. then you were yeah. talking about your dad. I lost my dad a couple years ago and yeah, you know, like we just, we love our dads. So that's a good thing. Yeah. I would say we're blessed, you know, that we have that. Uh, yeah. But then in the next frame, you had me laughing and I was like, okay, good. Yeah. Like I got my breath back, but I didn't tell right. you this when we spoke, I'm going to say it now is I got, there's several clips there early on where you're coming in and you're like destroying Phil Sims. It's like, you're just carving up down sack here, sack there. And I grew up five miles from giant stadium. So I got to tell you, at first I wasn't too thrilled with this, yeah. uh, with the NFL film clips that you had going on, so we're gonna put a sh we're gonna put this shot inside here, and I don't know if it's happening, but we're gonna say it's happening. It's Joe Morris, he's breaking your tackle. I'm gonna say he's jumping over downs, and he's gonna about to score a touchdown. That's what all I'm gonna say on here. <laughs> okay, I, I I would have to see that to know, but um, no, it yeah. looks like you're about to crash him. Is what it looks like. Okay, Joe's going well, nowhere. Probably, hopefully, he went down. I yeah, would be ashamed if he did. It looks like in two seconds he's about to go down. That's exactly what's going on. <laughs> okay, I was setting him up for Cubby. Yeah. Um, but but in all seriousness, yeah. um, the, the the NFL film is really incredible. You've got you know I, I talked about Randy, you've got Everson Walls, you got Ed Jones, you got um, former coach um, Jason Garrett, you got you know Jerry Jones. Man, everyone's singing your praises. Um, there were, that was great. I mean, that, that film obviously came out about my, um, mm -hmm. about me coming out, um, as a gay person. Yeah. Um, and they wanted to cover that and kind of memorialize it. Um, you know, being the first ever guy to be in a same sex marriage, it was, um, it was brutal. Yeah. Um, I had been married a long time to my ex-wife, Heather, who 
is still one of my best friends. We love each other a lot. Yeah. Um, and then we got divorced and, um, I had always, I had always felt this thing inside of me and I'd always prayed to God, please don't let it be. I didn't want to be gay, but I will tell everybody now that I have the opportunity that listens to this, that people are born gay. So it's not something you can, that just comes and goes. I had it my whole life, but I fought it. And, um, and I eventually, after I was not married anymore, let myself go mm-hmm. and um, became who I am now. And it's not easy. Um, I got married to, to Joshua. And uh, I'll, I'll tell everybody right now, any of you guys thinking about marrying a man, don't do it. Because uh, you will get henpecked more <laughs> by a gay man than you ever thought was possible by any woman. <laughs> You'll get told what to wear, what to eat. Did you go to the gym today? Um, all that kind of stuff. So all you guys who are thinking about coming out and marrying a man, give it, give it. You might have to have a long think about that because you will get henpecked. <laughs> it, you know, it must have taken enormous courage, right? It, and and when I think about this, you know, when I was watching your NFL films and, and, and hearing some of the guys talk, it's like, I think it was Joshua actually said it in, you know, in the films, like you had the opportunity, you, like you finally had the opportunity to be your authentic self. And I'm like, man, I, I feel like everyone deserves the right, you know, the opportunity to be their authentic self. And I haven't met him. I haven't met him yet. I know I will when we yeah. get out to California, uh, but I'm excited about meeting him and, and you know, your whole family is so supportive. Uh, There's a clip in there where you're, you know, your son is just, your kids are just a hundred percent supportive, nothing but love. You've got an amazing family. I do. You know, I think about this too, right, Jeff? You're not the only one, (laughs) you know, I think about all the sports out there, brother. Um, I don't Sorry, care what's it's, um, right. My family, my family, and my teammates, all my friends. Yeah, it's uh, it's amazing. I'm sorry, but I, I am yeah. so blessed to uh, to have had those kind of people. Yeah, and have them in my life because it's brutal. Like you can ask anybody that's been through it. It is not easy um yeah without them i don't know i i really don't know i just i'm so blessed yeah and uh and not you know down to almost a person yeah all of them um you're gonna have to cut this part yeah <laughs> it's okay we can do that <laughs> um um but um down to a person with the exception of one or two people everybody just said hey man you've always been a man of your word you're a good person um, and we love you. And uh, that was the end of it. I thought it was going to be a lot bigger deal when yeah. I had to get on the phone and call all my friends and tell my family and all this stuff because nobody knew. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was wrong. You know what? I was wrong because 99% of the people were totally supportive, as they should be. Yeah. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter your sexuality doesn't matter what your religion is none of that matters what matters is who you are and if you've got your act together and you're a good person then people are gonna people are gonna love you no matter what yeah yeah um yeah every every sport it's out there i hope everyone has the opportunity to be the their authentic self i love um you know i've had a couple friends that came out yeah changed nothing for me and my relationship with them i love them just as much and i thought about like yeah. the words that joshua and, and you it says you have finally had an opportunity yeah. to be your authentic self and everyone Sweet. deserves that right i love everson walls everson walls in that in that film is jeff is one of the guys we're teammates he's cool now we're i, I, love, I love those guys i love them then i love them today same with my yell to me same with my family and my friends i mean like i said it's like i can't wait for the day when it's not a big deal, you know? Right. Um, and, and I hope that what I did helps move that, um, move that along. Um, and, and create some kind of awareness where it sucks right now. It really does. But, um, you know, 
it's not the way it's going to be in 10 years. It's right. not the way it's going to be in 20 years. Things are going to get better and it's not yeah. going to be a big deal. It's kind of like not a big deal now, thank God. Right. Um, but it's, uh, it's something that needed to be done. And, um, and fortunately or unfortunately, I'm the poster boy. Yeah. Well, you're, you're a strong leader and yeah. you can carry that. Tell me about yeah. your, tell me about your passion for painting. When I, you know, when I saw that you're, you were painting and all, I yeah. was, felt like is, tell me about that. Is that part yeah. of like your way of expressing yourself at a point in time? Um, you know what? I just, I, I taught myself how to paint. I paint portraits. Um, I just finished, um, Jim Garrett. Jason Garrett's dad. Oh, wow. Jason doesn't, Jason doesn't even know yet. Hey, Jason, I need your address. <laughs> um, I kicked ass on this painting, though. Jim Garrett's my new buddy. Because when you spend a week painting somebody, you get to know them really well. But um, I painted Jim when he was a coach, I think, with the Giants. I, I'm not sure, but it's perfect. Um, painting is, I paint everybody in blue and white, no matter what their race is. Because, you know, part of my deal is everybody's the same person. So I don't really show color in my paintings. Um, but it's, it's really fun. Um, I'm getting pretty good at it and, um, it's just something to do now. And then I, I just paint them for people that I like and give them, <laughs> give them the painting. So I'm not selling anything. <laughs> You've got amazing. They're amazing. <laughs> I don't know Thank how you. you taught yourself how to do that, but I mean, I saw the one on, uh, Jim Brown. Uh, oh, Jim Brown's cool. Yeah. Like you've got some, they're, yeah. These are incredible. You know, we got a place out Thank in Santa you. Fe, and Santa Fe is like a little mecca of incredible artists. Your yeah. artwork could be on Canyon Road there. You know. There we go. Someday. Yeah. Someday. So <laughs> it's fun. I love. I love it, and um, most of them are pretty darn good. Yeah. Most of them are pretty darn good. Football player, champion of human rights, painter, film producer. Like, um, yeah, <laughs> tell me yeah, about one, that one more thing. Yeah. One more thing. And I probably shouldn't even say this, but yeah. I've got to, um, being part of the gay community, you know, of course I know, some, I know trans people, they're great people and they should have as much respect as anybody else. But, um, I am not, you know, I'm not one of those guys that thinks, uh, boys should play against girls. Um, my, uh, both of my kids played rugby. It's a very, very physical sport. And, you know, there's, People can get hurt, um, you know, maybe not swimming and stuff, but there's a lot of sports where it's dangerous. And, um, I, you know, although I am a gay man, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people pissed off that I'm going to say this, but it's, just, it's, it's a non-starter, you know, this whole conversation about um, contact sports and um, boys being allowed to play against girls because somebody's going to get hurt. And if, yeah. if some kid would have went out and played against my daughter, I would have went right up to that kid's dad taking care of the situation right there. It's just, it's silly. And, yeah. um, and I, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm probably, I probably just talked myself out of about 20, um, 20 dinners this year by saying this, but somebody has got to come out and say it for my yeah. community. So let it be me. No, I, I don't, I mean, I, I think about that, you know, my daughter, so she's in cheer. It's not yeah. really a contact sport, but if yeah. she was in a contact sport, if she was playing rugby and she was going up against, you know, the all blacks out of New Zealand, that's not going to work yeah. out real well for Jonna. <laughs> they, they, they won't. I mean, it's going to be to the point where, you know, you get involved with hockey or rugby or some, some sport yeah. like that. But, you know, the if I always, I, I always, I always like that movie slap shot. And then there's a, a Netflix documentary about a team called the trashers. Both of them are hockey movies. I saw it. But, yeah. Oh, did, is it trashers great? It's so incredible. Good. That place is like 30 miles from where I grew up. I can't even believe Danbury, it. Danbury. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> So, you know, like if, if somebody had a crazy idea, like up in New York somewhere where they brought in like 15 Canadian kids and said, you're going to identify as um, girls and they, they'd they win the national championship yeah. in, in girls hockey. I mean, they just would and most teams wouldn't finish the game. Right. So it's just, I mean, it, people need to just kind of face, face the facts and, and it's not fair to the, um, not fair to the parents who's girls have worked so hard in sport to have to compete against the biological male. It's, just, it's not possible. Um, yeah. And I, I understand the other side of the coin where, where people need, need to have the right. And that's why I say that, um, you know, I will say to everybody out there that 
you know, I, I do know quite a few trans people and they are good people mm -hmm. and they need to be treated with respect and dignity and love, um, just like everybody else. So absolutely, anyway. absolutely. Tell me yeah. about, tell me about the film productions. Tell me about like, you got three top 10 Super Bowl commercials. Yeah. You have one of the most iconic one. I am, in fact, maybe one of the, I think one of the best um, that I can ever recall when I think back about Super Bowl commercials. I know a lot of folks, some folks just tune in just to watch the yeah. commercials. You have the babies, the NFL babies. Yeah, yeah, we shot NFL babies. Um, I was a commercial line producer making TV commercials for uh, 15 years, and then I ran a couple commercial companies. Um, but it was, uh, you know, I, I've been to at least 25 countries and probably shot in 30 states and um, lived out of my suitcase for many years and working for the top directors in the world. Um, and, you know, you're on time, on budget. And that was the whole thing. And then leave the client happy and do great work. And, you know, I was just fortunate enough to work with some fantastic production houses, um, great directors. Not all, not all of them are great people. They're all, some of them are great people, great directors. There's a lot of directors who are terrible people, <laughs> um, especially the feature film guys, because they, they're just, some of those guys are, they're just not nice. Um, yeah. They get caught up in that Hollywood thing and they get weird, but Super Bowl Babies was fun. The Doritos commercial, we got top 10 and I think we made that for like 10,000 uh, bucks, but it was just such a great script. Unbelievable. Um, but it, it's been fun. I got to work with Tiger a couple of times. I've done, you know, a bunch of big Nike stuff and um, it was a great run. Yeah, great run. But t taught me how to be back to finances on time, on schedule. Yeah, on budget. Those three right there. You're gonna? Are, do you have plans, or do you think you'll want to do another advert at some point? Yeah, I will for Toro Bravo when we start talking about that. But yeah, my, okay. My new company, Toro Bravo. We're definitely. I've got some great ideas for that. Awesome, awesome. They, they involve they involve a Yeti too, a, a big foot, <laughs> a man in a costume in my truck. <laughs> All right, we're going to hold on to our problem. In fact, what we're, we're going to do is we're going to take a quick break over here. Um, and then when we come back, um, we're going to talk about Toro Bravo. We're going to talk about a charity as well that you're working on here yeah. in Dallas, in the Dallas yeah, area. Sure. So uh, hang on, everyone, and uh, we'll be back in just a few. Experience. It makes all the difference. The Pin Valenti Group has decades of experience in navigating clients through various market cycles since the early 1980s. We have the experience investors need to help make the right decisions when it matters most. We invest our time in building strong relationships with our clients. This leads to better outcomes for our clients. Investing for the long run is the right advice, but it ignores basic human nature. The fear and greed cycle leads investors to buy high and sell low. We help our clients become informed investors by maintaining the highest standard of care with consistent communication regardless of the market's direction. We act as the voice of reason with realistic expectations for how markets actually behave. Over shorter periods, market returns have a very wide range of results. Over longer time periods, outcomes tend to center around long-term averages. History matters. We don't panic during times of market stress. Big drawdowns in the stock market have been a common occurrence, and we understand that's typically when our clients need us most, and the manifestation of our work together will likely be most evident. We prefer preparation over panic, and understand that though diversification is key, it is also hard. Why? Because true diversification means holding underperforming assets. If everything is working, it means your portfolio is not actually diversified. With the knowledge of behavioral biases such as loss aversion, we understand that losses are more painful than gains are pleasing. The math behind diversification makes sense, but its psychology can be troubling. Experience. It makes all the difference. And that's peace of mind for our clients when it matters most. Give us a call at 214-373-2925 or find us online at pinvalentigroup.com. Let's see how our experience can help you better achieve your goals and enhance your family legacy. Okay, friends, thanks for hanging around. For part two of the Legacy Summit, we've been speaking with my friend Jeff Rohr. 
uh, here today, and we've been discussing his ama amazing legacy on and off the field. And Jeff, we kind of talked a little bit about it before we went to break here, but Toro Bravo, fishing, skiing, beaches, mountains, you took all the cool things that I love and put it all into one beautiful package called Toro Bravo. Tell us about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We found white space in the RV market. Um, basically, uh, you know, the RVs, if, if you take them out to the wilderness, most of them are two-wheel drive and uh, you're hauling a living room uh, with you. And, and ours, we decided to make it so the whole back opens up. Um, a little more of a work truck, a little more of a Yeti version of an RV. You can basically hose it out and uh, and a badass Ford 4x4. Four four. And um, we put it together. We, um we were at the LA Auto Show, um, and then we just got the cover of RV Pro Magazine. I think we're one of the first startups ever to get it um, because we are disrupting the RV market. It's a super cool product, product. Um, and it is, uh, it's is—it's a write-off for business owners, too, which is good for your uh, audience because you can use it as a work truck during the week. It's there you go. I could use that sometimes, I could tell you. Back yeah. in the old days when I had to come around with like an 80-page, you know, um document for clients to look at before like east like the, i could have used it <laughs> yeah it's it, it, it's awesome and we're getting great reviews and it's validated by the press which makes it a lot easier when you're trying to sell them because it's not me it's them saying it well we're going to drop your link to toro bravo here nice. so folks can uh go out there and check it out um, but right now we're going to expand the conversation and we're going to bring on someone that you know pretty well Tess Painter, welcome to the Legacy Summit. Thank you for having me. You bet, you bet. Now you're working alongside Jeff on a pretty cool charity, right? It's gonna help a lot of people. Yes. Tell us about it. Well, Charity Road is a new nonprofit and our mission is to take previously unmonetized naming of streets and convert that into food for children and their families. So streets get named all the time. Developers get to name them, cities stamp the approval, and nobody's transacting these. And I looked at that. We just turned in the plans with all the street names for development. And I'm like, why couldn't we do, have done this, you know, to raise money? So we are. I love it. I love it. And you put together a pretty impressive board, right? Jeff is obviously on the board. Yes. Um, talk about some of the folks on the board. Okay. So we have Jeff. Yay. I'm so thankful. You know, Jeff started us, helped us structure with his nice deck template and everything. And then we have Scarlett Valente of White Space Methods. I think I know her. I think you do too. Yeah. Great name. <laughs> and so Scarlett has organized everything. I mean, from every little breath, she took everything and just made it seamlessly connect every every aspect. Um, converted to charityroad.org. If you take a look at the website, she basically structured that. Now the website was built by Chris Heaney, but she structured all the content. It was content I had, but she made it look pretty yeah. and put it in a manner that makes sense. And then she found some other aspects of it. And she's also going to be contributing to helping people uh, fish rather than just give them a fish. Uh, she's going to be working on some workshops that'll help some of these people rethink how they think, reorganize how they think, and see opportunities. Because a lot of people don't see opportunities because of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? If you're not eating, you can't evolve to the next level. So we're going to work on making sure people can eat and then giving them a way to see opportunity. I love it. I love it. So I went on the website, got to take a look at it. So the streets are the street that's can get named is in Paris, Texas. Paris, Texas, right around the corner from the Eiffel Tower that has the big red hat. The on big top. red hat. <laughs> hat. <laughs> that, that's right. So Amelia was going to put the website on here. I yeah. There, so people can make a donation. Yes. Right. So it's not just you know about bidding for. So make a donation. Five hundred one C three. Correct. Right. I love that. So we always talk about it. Um, if you work for an organization, you can make a donation and sometimes your company might match, match it. it. Right? We would so love that. You can Bring get double yeah. the donations to right. the organization. And I kind of thought about too, like, you know, this is the legacy summit, having a street 
maybe not necessarily named after yourself, but maybe you want to name it after a loved one. Maybe yeah. after an organ, your organization. Maybe after a child. Yes. Or something like that, right? So it's an exactly. opportunity for folks to really kind of put a stamp, put their name on a street here in town. Exactly. And honor someone or whatever they want to do. But they can do that and then they can feel extra special about it because they help feed people. So they didn't just do the name. They yeah. help that every dollar, everything outside of the money through the donations and the auction are being paid for by sponsors. So 100% of this money that you donate minus the transaction fees, but 100% of the money that you donate or that goes from the bid will be going to the um, to food. We're going to buy turkeys because turkeys are cheaper cheaper by the pound than apples. Are they really? Yes, and they're a lot more filling. I eat a lot of apples. I know that's where a lot of my money is going. I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, apples are great. Apples great. <laughs> but we're gonna we're doing a lot of turkeys. Okay. So Benny Keith's giving us a good deal on the turkeys, and then you know if we get enough and everybody gets tired of turkey, maybe they'll give us a good deal on chicken. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Tell me a little bit about um, some of the events that you all are planned, right? Because you've got some great folks like Jeff that yes. are on the board. Yes, yes. Um, I think there's going to be an onsite that's going to get planned. Um, yes. Maybe talk a little bit about that. Okay. Um, April 6th is the end of the auction. That's the end of this event. And we're going to take it out with a bang. It's a Saturday. We're going to have an event. Stay tuned at charityroad.org so that you can know where we're doing it um, okay. because we're working on that right now. That might be Scarlett working on that. Um, and uh, William, who's also on our board, William Eckroth, of Total Capacity Entertainment. Okay. And so between them, they'll figure out the event. Uh, we decided to have the event because people kept saying they would donate things. They assumed we were having an event with our fundraiser. <laughs> and I'm like, I'll it. give a painting, I'll give this, I'll give that. And I'm like, okay, we have all this stuff. And Scarlett's like, we're having an event. So then the event, you'll be able to, to the last hour, we'll still take in auctions and try to bring in more money and obviously donations. Yeah. And we'll celebrate the winner. Uh, so it's gonna be super exciting it is. that. I'm looking forward to it. I'm excited about the opportunity to uh, to tell our folks and tell our listeners about uh, Charity Road. Uh, we're big. Our team has always been a real big supporter and believer in giving back to the community. And I love this because as an Italian family, it does start with food. <laughs> and exactly. giving exactly. food back to the community is a great, great charity. And it's an excellent legacy. So um, we're looking forward to the final details on that. Um, all right, folks, we are running out of time here. Jeff, thank you so much. I can't thank you enough for making time to be on the show here today. I appreciate this conversation so much, talking yes, about football, non-football, um, all Charity the things Road. that you're doing. And, and Charity Road is going to be so awesome. I Absolutely. love it. Yeah, it's awesome. Good it's, things it's to good avenue. people. It's an avenue to feed people. How about that? I, Absolutely. And, and I love it. And I love it. And Tess, thank you as well. I know thank you're doing you so a lot much. of hard work. You and the board members yes. are doing a lot of hard work for yes. this. And um, I could tell you, I know how many hours are going in there. Yeah, you're, I appreciate doing your good, personal you're doing sacrifice since I have stolen your wife from you. <laughs> <laughs> she says she's been working hard, but that's okay because that's what we do. And that's what creates a legacy. Absolutely. Okay. And she has definitely put her mark on all of it. This would be impossible, I've got to tell you, without Scarlett and Jeff and, and William, um, in particular uh, Scarlett, because uh, two of the first three weeks of this little venture that's only been a little over a month, I was down with COVID. Yeah. And Scarlett's like, I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do this. I just sent her everything. Like, here's the verbiage I had. Here are all these pictures. Here's the idea. And then she put it all together beautifully. Made Jeff it happen. It, made it happen. Jeff had sent over a deck format. So Scarlett kind of started with a little plug and play. And then she moved it all around and made something amazing. So, yeah. And so thank you for sacrificing your time with your wife. <laughs> <laughs> you bet. You bet. All right, folks. So we are out of time here today. Again, my name is Antonio Valenti. I'm a certified private wealth advisor professional here in Dallas. We're servicing clients across the country. Uh, if you'd like to be a guest on the Legacy Summit or need assistance with your family wealth planning, please reach out to me. Legacies are made and protected with intentionality and purpose. And my team and I are ready to have a legacy conversation with you. Thank you so much and God bless.